Okay, uh, Sherry. So uh, Sherry is actually the uh, senior solution architect from, uh, from Software AG. And uh, he is an enterprise solution strategist uh, and then helping different IT leaders to accelerate the digital transform. So yeah, uh, so let me pass the time to Sherry. Oh, so can you help to uh, maybe share your screen? Yep, yep. Okay, okay, so. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, okay. Very excited to be here, though I miss the art house and the nice parliament setting, you know, that gives you a feel of lawmaker. Anyways, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump straight in and talk about how microservices can actually set you back and how do you take control of it, right? So let's begin with the purpose of microservices. Uh, before we go to why, let's first see what is microservices, right? And I often hear the confusion around microservices and APIs. So just to set the context, APIs are contracts on how a service could be consumed. It tells you what is the request, response, or in other words, input and output, and the data format you use, like XML, JSON, et cetera. So it's only a definition on how you could consume a service. Now, microservice is a deployment architecture. Microservices could be APIs, could be a part of web application, it could be anything. You could um, break down a big monolith application into many small services and deploy them independently with its own runtime and data. Now, that gives you the flexibility of choosing any different underlying infrastructure, you know, like Java, or Python, or Node.js, so on and so forth. So it gives you the ability to deploy multiple copies of the same service. So you get scalability and redundancy. Importantly, this also gives you the agility to change your whole business application easily and without any downtime or interruption to business. Now, this is the most important capability for business, right? As your business transforms, now, be it digital transformation, or even if the business is adopting a whole new model in response to the pandemic situation, microservices architecture gives you the agility to respond uh, faster to business changes. COVID has clearly forced businesses to change, you know, the way they do business, be it digital payments or going online only. You need your IT systems to support these and you need agility so you could adapt and change quickly to support the dynamic nature of business. Right, so, um, I'm sorry. The main issue with the three-tiered monolith architecture is that if any one piece of functionality needs to change, the entire system must undergo a release cycle. So this costs more and results in slow delivery times for important new features and capabilities. Over time, some monolithic systems also struggle to keep up with the scale needed by the business since it's difficult to expand their capacity. So this can be a major impediment to growth. Microservices solve these problems by separating all those pieces of functionality to run independently. When business needs change, microservices make it easier to adapt quickly, and they provide virtually unlimited scalability powered by cloud containers. And that said, it's not going to be an easy change from your existing monolithic architecture. As you can imagine, you will have tens and hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, monolithic applications supporting various facets of business, be it your logistics application, order management, or even your core application that powers your business, right? For example, if you're a bank, your core banking application. So what does it take for you to move from monoliths to microservices? Well, there are many different things. Firstly, there are multiple different patterns. There are microservices patterns, serverless patterns, and multiple others. The way you design your application itself is very different, and it, it follows a different pattern. Then you have uh, processes, you have uh, DevOps and pipeline process, 
CACD tools, you know, infrastructure as a code to provision. And then there are different container platforms, public, cloud, private cloud, so on and so forth. So it's a major change when you move from monoliths to microservices. And let's not forget the people part of it. This needs a lot of new expertise, new skill set, new practices in the way you develop applications. And that's why you see a lot of platforms and products in the market to help you succeed in your microservices journey. Because it's very difficult. And if you look at the number of uh, microservices in production today, actual production will be very less. Yes, it comes with lots of benefits, but it's not easy to achieve. So all these API and microservices platforms enable you to smoothly transition to microservices architecture by letting your existing mainstream developers to do what they are good at. Focus on solving your business problems and build business applications instead of spending efforts on complex processes and handling you know, infrastructure related issues. Let's drill down a little deeper. As any good architect knows, there are trade-offs in every architecture. Traditional on-prem deployment of services, in what we call monolithic architecture, was focused on quality and reliability. Having all the services in one place made it easier for IT to establish protocols to control changes. SOA introduced the concept of using services to expose data and capabilities you know, previously trapped in custom applications. So uh, let's say govern and reuse them. But developers still created services on a single platform. And any time that platform had to change, you know, for upgrades, for hardware maintenance, all the services running on it are affected. So developers had to coordinate their changes and scalability was difficult. So like I mentioned before, you can achieve agility and scalability by embracing microservices. But automation and DevOps becomes essential at this uh, end of the spectrum. You can have tens or hundreds of services running that need to connect with each other, be managed and monitored, restarted and updated. So how are these services going to find each other? Say, when IP addresses change, every time a new container comes up, every time a new Kubernetes pod comes up, how will they securely connect with each other without uh, centralized security tooling? Containers go down in the cloud. You know, uh, how will failures be detected? And how will services retry? With a distributed cloud architecture, how does an application log, monitor, and trace service calls? Will you code it in each service? How do you maintain that? So, you know, service mesh arose to handle many of these service uh, issues. So they are common uh, functions you need to implement in every service, like monitoring, logging events, um, tracing requests, executing and encrypting all outbound calls, routing traffic to the service. In a service mesh, a sidecar proxy is attached to each service and it handles all the standard functions that every service needs. It's, it's called a mesh because the sidecar proxies handle all communications between the services and the application, creating a network mesh of services. Service mesh can take care of these functions so the developer doesn't have to. It can handle service discovery, it provides you with services and endpoints that are available in the network mesh. This is like a DNS query. It provides you with uh, visibility, uh, with a centralized location or collection of all service metrics and logs for debugging purpose. It provides you with fault tolerance. You know They have the circuit breaker patterns and all that. It provides you with connectivity. It can route, um, you know, it can do traffic. You can do traffic configuration. You can control how traffic gets to your cluster. You can configure the ports and protocols and all those things. So yes, service mesh comes with capabilities that let you do happy coding. Like the previous session, I should mention that it gives you, it comes with lots of benefits and not to worry about how you discover service or how you do logging, you know, so on and so forth. 
you don't need to write code to all these things. Like you see in this picture on the left side, you see services without mesh handling all these things in the code. And on the right, uh, you see services with just business logic and rest of the things are taken care by mesh. So far, so good. But you will see how dangerous your microservices ecosystem could become if you are not conscious of high level design and structure. So that is why we apply disciplines and frameworks, you know, like domain driven design. So we bring, we bring the structure to be able to better control what we do. Clean our architecture to see what is going on. You know, think of domains as independent modules and aligned to business capability. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, as an example, um, let's say payment as a domain for fintech industry or even banks. So you will have multiple different microservices. And of course, they are all independent and you might have higher level APIs that could orchestrate several microservices to offer some payment service. So this is the combined power of microservices and APIs. So within the domain, you will have lots of interactions among microservices and service mesh will help you finding the services tracing in case of issues, you know, on higher level visibility. When you have these uh, domains cutting across, um, cutting across domains, we will need to make sure that we have ways to connect the domains via uh, some ingress controllers like API gateway. These gateways may not necessarily be used for routing traffic, but more for managing your services, providing visibility into them as an application. So, but be aware that as the environment grows faster, the, the, the complexity grows as well, and it grows faster and faster, right? Uh, and it's a perfect paradox uh, because you need microservices in large numbers to see the value and when you have them in large numbers, it will keep you up all night with nightmares, you know, of what it looks like a dead star. So we are at a state where it takes an army of admins to run and maintain it, and very likely only a handful of people who really understand it. So as a solution, we not only need a structure and discipline in place, we also need a higher level governing body which can provide overview and control of the entire landscape. Of course, we need something that can provide visibility, control, and governance. API management can be one such platform. But to do this effectively, it also needs a component which could operate within the mesh and meshes. It's not only external, but you need something sitting at a higher level, looking at multiple meshes and control what is happening. While API management can do this, a uh, governing body connecting microservices and API world together, it is not the ideal solution. It needs a totally different runtime component designed and built specifically for that purpose. So, you know, you are aware of the edge gateway or the enterprise gateway, it's not new. And we know its purpose, situated at the edge to handle the not so traffic, primarily the incoming request from your external world. Once we start building our microservices, we will have traffic flowing from one microservice to another. And this needs a component to control the microservices. And it could be deployed as sidecars or centrally, and again, primarily to help regulate the microservices traffic. This component cannot be edge gateway. As you can imagine, the small runtime component you will need in Kubernetes, and it definitely needs to be lightweight from a deployment perspective. So a micro gateway uh, fit for this purpose. Now you have two components, edge gateway for regulating external traffic and micro gateway to regulate your internal traffic. You can extend this further to build logical business APIs within you know, something like a domain and make them available on your edge gateway. And um, as we explained before, service mesh gives you a lot of flexibility at a cost. In many cases, the benefit will be big enough to you know, justify the cost. However, when service mesh gives us all the benefits, you know, like discoverability, the observability, fault tolerance, 
it forces to code in other places you know things like in distributed architecture we often don't put too strict uh, security on the edge that's not all the security all the services needed if we don't provide more security to the service mesh um, you know you may introduce a uh, security hole or someone who is entitled to use other service will be allowed to operate within a mesh and it will give them access to everything even if you don't want it so again in service mesh to prevent it we would have to code many times as many times microservices uh, we have but that's not what we wanted right so we wanted adopting um, service mesh we wanted the infrastructure to do this for us so that is why at software ag we worked on app mesh app mesh closes this gap in service mesh by in a way taking what you would have to code into your microservices and allowing you to do this by configuring policies the ones we know from api management app mesh allows you to look at um, a service mesh and see application apis you can configure your enforcement on application at a business level as well you can inject them in a very unintrusive way into the mesh um, so we have a micro gateway over here playing a role so eventually you can build a logical architecture like this one with uh, one governing body having an oversight and control all the deployment regardless whether they are monoliths or microservice based you have something like two domains here with some of the services here are monoliths and some are microservices and some are mixture of it so it gives you the flexibility to embrace a uh, new while having your valuable old applications and then you have api gateways for cross domain interactions and then you have api portal uh, to document and expose the apis to outside world and put some governance and you now engage with developers so to recap we do microservices with an objective right so they do provide you the flexibility and agility it helps you to change or adapt quickly when the business dynamics change like what we see in this pandemic but it doesn't come free of cost if it is not managed it can blow up and cause more trouble maintaining them like i said microservices move the complexity from developers to operations team service mesh does help but there are some gaps and developers are burdened to handle those gaps in the code and that actually creates a kind of anti pattern if you look at it and makes your code less flexible and app mesh bridges this gap between api and microservices it brings visibility and control and by the way we have been ranked as a leader of leaders by forester with highest score in the current offering as well as our future strategy you get to access the complete report on our website softwareg.com and you could also give us a try so please do visit our website for free, free trials you can also download docker images directly from docker store and before i forget we have a workshop in another 30 minutes and we plan to show you how this whole app mesh works and how it can make a developer life easy so please do join us in a short while um we will take questions in that session so if you have any questions posted i'm not saying it now so if you have any questions posted we will take them in the next session with that let me pass the control back to patrick okay thanks uh thanks sorry for the sharing so uh as he mentioned so uh they actually have a, a booth and also have a workshop that uh, actually can answer some detailed question from you so take the time to to visit the booth uh, in the uh, next time uh, in the in the future sections okay so thanks for your help so i think that's all for the uh for the section before lunch and then uh, maybe you can take your time to visit different booth and also to, uh, grab some food uh and then get prepared and come back by 1 p.m. we will have another four sections uh, talking about the connect aspect thank you